So, uh, oh, recording in progress. Okay, very good. Oh, okay. No, we. <laughs> One more thing. I, I realized we didn't communicate, and I thought it was centrally communicated by Zebra, but um, uh, but maybe it wasn't. Um, the sort of um, allocated time for presenters and discussants. Um, we have forty minutes per paper, so I would suggest twenty-five, ten, five. So twenty-five for presentation, ten for discussants, and then five for overall questions. Uh, we can be flexible in case you've prepared something a bit longer or shorter, but uh, please try not to overdo it uh, too much if you can. Sorry for not communicating this earlier. I thought it was uh, centrally done, but apparently not so. Does that work for every, everyone? The 25, 10, 5? Okay, we are live in the webinar for people to show up. Sounds good. I see Miles and Maria Sole are here now. Very good. So I think we're all complete in terms of speakers and discussants. That's great. Uh, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can uh, hear you yes. fine. Yes. Great. Hello. Hi, Maria Sole. So Miles and Maria Sole, we, um, we just discussed or uh, mentioned that uh, we have a 25-10 allocation for speakers and discussants. Uh, it wasn't communicated. I thought it had been done centrally, but I hope that's okay for you. So uh, just to, to make clear, it's 25 for both the presentation and the discussion? Or? No, 25 for the presenter, 10 for ah, the discussion. Okay. Very good because I mean, of the, give, the, give or take. I mean, try to try to sort of stay more or less within those um, boundaries. So uh, we have a couple of minutes left at the end for questions from the. Okay, the no, because it was communicated at other points, but I remember it was twenty and ten. That's why. 20, I 20, 20 and 10. And 10. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that oh that was communicated. Okay, so I missed that. Yes. Okay, so perfect. I didn't want to confuse anyone. So twenty ten it is, and then we have ten minutes for a broad broader uh, open floor discussion. That's even better. Perfect. Okay. Okay, thanks. very good. So 2010, 10. Very good. Sorry for the confusion. That's all right. I'll do my best to stick to my 10 minutes. Yes. That would be, that would be good. All right. It's uh, one minute past six. So I think we're ready to start. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, session um, The Impact of Climate Change on Inflation and Monetary Policy. Uh, organized by Deutsche Bundesbank. Christoph Meinerding and uh, myself are representing here at Deutsche Bundesbank. Um, we're very happy to have a great, uh, a great set of papers and discussants uh, uh, in this, in this uh, room. Then climate change has become an, a major issue for um, um, many of us uh, in recent years uh, and in central banks uh, as well. Um, as we're speaking, the governing council of the ECB is ironing out uh, some of the last um, um, some of the last uh, um, issues uh, regarding uh, their future approach uh, to incorporate climate change uh, into uh, the monetary policy framework, and um, so some of the issues that we're going to hear about today are really uh, front and center in the central banking uh, discussion. So we're very happy to have a great set of papers on these issues. The first paper will be by uh, Maria Sole Bagliari from Banque de France. Um, uh, and the discussions will be Francesca Di Luiso from uh, the Mercato Research Institute on uh, Global Commons and Climate Change. So, uh, Maria Soli, maybe you can start sharing your screen. Yes, I will do that right away. You should be able to see it now. Yes, perfect. So the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I will try to do the... Sorry about that, but there is this uh, control uh, panel of uh, Zoom, which is exactly in front of the, of the controls. So now, now you should see the, the full screen. 
So first of all, thanks um, to the chairs for organizing this very interesting session. As uh, uh, Dr. Munch was uh, mentioning, I mean, uh, climate change has become really, really important. Uh, though, I mean, uh, the debate has been a bit uh, set aside during the, uh, you know, the most uh, difficult moments of the pandemic crisis. But uh, I mean, uh, the, the topic is coming back uh, to forth in policy circles. So I think it's really relevant to have. Uh, uh, a good uh, uh, established uh, back of research on that. So this is a paper, as mentioned already, um, joint with uh, uh, Massimo Ferrari from the European Central Bank. I think he's also in the, in the audience right now. And uh, so uh, the usual disclaimer applies. Uh, and this is really a paper about uh, the policy alternatives that country can have at their disposal to Tackle, uh, tackle, sorry, uh, climate change, and in particular to achieve uh, the climate objective, which is compatible with the Paris Agreement. And also, we uh, inquire in the same paper whether international cooperation across countries really plays a role. So, big spoiler here: yes, it plays a role, and even a, a very important one. So. Just to provide you with a bit of background here, um, the IMF was really the first, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the first big institution working extensively on the topic of climate change. And uh, in 2019, they released a fiscal monitor, which has been, uh, which has become a bit uh, the reference, in particular in policy circles, in terms of the, the climate objective uh, there. Uh, formules, um, formulated, sorry. Um, so taking into consideration the uh, Paris Agreement and the commitment to keep uh, um, warming, global warming uh, within two degrees Celsius from uh, uh, pre-industrial levels, the IMF has said that uh, this is uh, achievable, this can be attained only if uh, current emissions will be cut by 50% in 30 years. And this is uh, exactly what we refer to throughout the paper when we talk about the climate objective. So in our paper, basically, we impose as objective something which is compati compatible with the Paris Agreement. So if you look at the right hand side chart here, it's really the red line. So our paper deals with the red line. So it deals with policies that make the Paris Agreement achievable. Now, let's start with the contributions just to provide you with a, a quick overview and a, a better sense of where we are going with this presentation. First of all, in this paper, we, uh, there is um, a first part, which is an empirical part, where we document the existence of a nonlinear relationship between emissions and economic performance, meaning that uh, past emissions influence uh, the way that uh, an, an additional increase in current emissions uh, have an effect uh, on macro variables. Then in the, in the second part of the paper, we construct an estimate, which is really the back of the paper, we construct an estimate, a structural two-country model, where you have two different sectors, production sectors, uh, composed of brown and green firms on the other side, uh, and we use uh, euro area and US data to estimate the model. So the two countries of reference are US and euro area. Then we introduce in this model an environmental externality, which takes the form of uh, aggregate uh, GDP emissions. Uh, so, 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 Mario Sole, sorry. Mario Sole, we yeah. cannot see uh, uh, your, your, ac your actual slide. We can only see this, uh, the first slide. Okay, okay you, perfect. Yeah, I, you I seem think to be the, working off the wrong screen. You got it now. Uh, so, you, okay, now we are on the third slide. Do you see that? Um, yes, we see. Okay, now this that. is a problem with the full screen and the Mac. Apparently, Zoom is not really compatible with the Mac full screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, as I was mentioning, uh, in this model, we have an environmental externality. This is the third bullet point here, which takes the form of aggregate losses uh, that are produced by brown firms. So, brown firms uh, are the only responsible for um, this environmental externality. And uh, then we, uh, in this particular setting, we formulated the optimal policy problem. So we take into consideration different containment policies that governments might implement, so fiscal, monetary, a combination of the two, and even trade policy in form of tariffs. And then we evaluate these policies in two scenarios, a scenario where countries go ahead with their own plans. And so they implemented their own policies without taking into consideration what the other country does. And uh, uh, another scenario where there is cooperation or let's say co policy coordination between the two economies. So what are the main takeaways here? Uh, first of all, and I'm gonna show you this in a moment, we find some uh, uh, threshold effects. Uh, empirical evidence shows us that there are some threshold effects of emissions and output. Then uh, in, uh, in terms of, uh, um, as regards to the, the model with environmental externalities, we find that uh, the estimates produced that by these models are really closer in terms of emission costs, are really closer to what, the, uh, what are the uh, 
uh, empirical estimates of reference produced by the relevant literature. Then in the same model, we find evidence of relevant spillovers of the US uh, onto the Euro area, which have become stronger starting from 2016. And then another additional finding is that monetary policy in this particular setting uh, focuses only on inflation targeting, or also in the case uh, of the United States, where you know that the Fed has a dual mandate. Uh, finally, in terms of optimal policy, first of all, what we find is that uh, uh, thinking about the climate objectives, so the reduction of emissions by 50%, monetary policy is completely ineffective in this sense. On the other hand, the fiscal policy is really the policy lever that is capable of uh, reaching the climate objective. However, when uh, uh, this policy, uh, fiscal policy, uh, is, uh, is implemented, uh, it also entails wealth and loss. So uh, the climate policy, let's call it the climate policy, per se, if pursued in isolation, uh, is uh, not incentive compatible. It becomes incentive compatible only if two, com two conditions are met. First of all, monetary policy should act uh, to offset partially the welfare costs associated to the fiscal interventions. And secondly, the two countries have to cooperate in, their, in the implementation of their fiscal policies. And finally, we show in the very last part of the paper that tariffs are also very inefficient uh, in tackling the, the climate objective. So given this, let's start with empirical evidence. I will uh, uh, go through this part uh, kind of quickly because it's not really the back of the paper. Uh, so first of all, in the very first part of the paper, we start by setting up a very simple reduced form model in the form of a regression of uh, um, GDP per capita on two emissions for the two countries. And here what really matters and uh, what I will draw your attention on is the evidence of a non-linear relationship between uh, GDP per capita and emissions. Uh, in particular, if you look at the highlighted uh, coefficients, you see that uh, they are negative, uh, first of all, and secondly, they are different from one. So the relationship between the GDP and emissions, both in the euro area and the, in, the, in the US is not linear. In the euro area is inverse quadratic and the US is less than linear. So there is already a, a great de de degree, sorry, of heterogeneity already here. Then in the second part of the empirical uh, uh, part, uh, we uh, set up, I mean, we, we reverted to a more structural model, which is a regime switching uh, recursive VAR. Basically, we take into consideration six endogenous variables that describe a big economy. So you have uh, growth of emissions, uh, GDP, um, inflation, uh, two measures of returns to capital in uh, the brown and green sector, and uh, the uh, shadow rate of interest. And we um, construct with these variables a uh, um, threshold VR where you have uh, regime switching uh, that is driven by the past growth of emissions. So you have regime one, which is a low emission regime, let's say, and regime two, which is a high emission regi regime. And here I'm going to show you only the matrix of contemporaneous coefficients. Here, basically, you have the six uh, um, coefficients of emissions for the different variables uh, in the two regimes. So first of all, uh, what it can be drawn uh, as a conclusion here is that uh, the higher the growth of emissions in the past, the more negative is the effect of the current emissions growth uh, onto um, output today. And this holds uh, uh, both for the Euro area and the United States. And then a second important finding is that, as you can see, the effect on uh, prices, the pass through of, of emissions on prices is really muted, if significant at all, in both economies. And this is something that we have to really take into consideration uh, um, when setting up the model. So the main takeaway is that uh, there are threshold effects, so no linearities, and in particular, it looks like uh, most of the effect of emissions passes by the supply side rather than the demand side of the economy. So we rationalize all of these in the bulk of the, in the, the central part of the paper, which is really uh, where we construct the structural model. So basically, as I was mentioning before, in our model, you have a production externalities that take the form of aggregate loss in production uh, following Nordhaus and Eutel. So basically, if you think about a, a common standard aggregate production function, in our specification, you have that uh, a portion um, of production, so a portion of uh, the output from the uh, inputs of capital and labor is based because of these uh, um, of these costs. So basically uh, here you have the script L, which is the loss function, which takes, uh, which can be interpreted as the GDP cost of total externality X, where X is the stock of total emissions. And uh, the model, the let's say the environmental part of the model is completed by the low motion of emissions. So you have a low motion for new emissions. That's the first equation and the stock of emissions. That's the second equation. 
with the stock on emissions being uh, relatively, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, uh, persistent over time. So here we calibrate the row so that the half-life is 90 years. So we follow the literature in this. So we take this uh, environmental part and we nest it into a two-sector economy. So each country has uh, two production sectors, the brown and the green. And the externality problem arises from the fact that uh, only the brown firms uh, are responsible for emissions. So they produce the externality. But then the externality spills over onto the green sector as well, as you can see from the equations here. And then in order to make sure that the, the two production sectors really coexist, we also postulate a difference in capital productivity. So the two parameters here, alpha B and alpha G, are different from each other and they are calibrated uh, using a microdata, in particular the return on assets that are uh, taken for the two economies. And then, as I said, it's also a two country model. So take the two sector structure and uh, also consider the, two, the international dimension uh, where you have that uh, emissions uh, are produced by both economies. So you have a, a two different law of motion for new emissions, uh, one for the home economy, one for the domestic economy. And then you have that uh, both these new emissions uh, feed into the total stock of externalities, so the total stock of emissions. And therefore, the production of emission of each country also has negative effects uh, onto the other economy. And this is actually the element that makes uh, arise the so-called policy, co so policy coordination problem. And then this is a bit of the uh, wrap up of the, of the entire model. And basically here, I will add just some uh, remarks. First of all, we postulate a quadratic loss function. So script L um, takes a form which has been already um, used by Golosov and co-authors. There is a negative, I mean, a, a perverse feedback loop between output and emission. So if you have an increase in brown production, this increases in turn the negative externality. So, the cost of such externality, and this has, a, again, a downward effect on the same brown production. And as I said before, XT, so the stock of emission is highly persistent, uh, given the calibration, and this has effects uh, um, for the optimal policy in the steady state. So given these uh, um, pr pretty quickly, we also estimate the model. This is actually one of the contributions of our paper compared to the uh, most relevant literature. So we estimate uh, the model using 12 macroeconomic time series for the euro area and the euro s, uh, sorry, the, the US, uh, and uh, the estimated parameters in the model are the shocks, the monetary policy parameter, price stickiness parameter, the parameter that uh, governs the emission production, and the two parameters that uh, shape the uh, aggregate cost of emissions. And then, I mean, this is a, a simply um, a picture to, to give you an idea where how our uh, model fares compared to others. Here you have a list of uh, um, other um, papers, uh, studies uh, produced over time. Uh, some of them are empirical, some of them are um, uh, theoretical. And as you can see, the first two bars here are really the estimated the GDP losses due to climate, uh, uh, to emissions, so uh, related to climate. In particular, our, our estimate our, uh, for the US uh, is pretty aligned with some earlier empirical studies, whereas other estimates are a bit more um, extreme, let's say. So let, our paper compared to others affairs uh, relatively well, and uh, in particular, the estimates of GDP losses uh, seem more realistic and more aligned to the empirical estimates. Now, this is the last part of the presentation and of the paper, but nonetheless, one of the most important. Here we consider uh, the policies were, that can be implemented by countries in order to achieve the climate objective of 50% uh, reduction in uh, uh, new emissions. Uh, we start by taking in consideration monetary policy. Now, in uh, an environment where you have the externality, but no policy initiative whatsoever to um, re deal with this uh, externality, uh, optimal monetary policy, uh, which is based on a common standard the Taylor rule, uh, would uh, prescribe uh, uh, pure inflation targeting both in the euro area and the US. Uh, and this is given by these uh, uh, estimates here that are the uh, coefficients that in the policy rule would be given to inflation and uh, output gap. And you can see in any case that the output gap coefficient is always zero. So in this framework, uh, standard optimal monetary policy focuses on inflation targeting. However, the question is whether this would uh, change uh, 
I mean, as you can see also, the, the, I mean, you wouldn't have any reduction. This is the expected the growth in emission, any reduction in emission. And sometimes you would have also have some uh, uh, weird effects for uh, welfare. Um, so the question is whether this can be uh, changed by uh, implementing a green monetary policy. So by also in including the climate objective in the loss function of the central bank, Actually, the answer is no. For in the interest of time here, I'm not going to show you the results. But actually, even by considering a sort of mon green monetary policy setting, where the climate objective is included in the loss function of the central bank, not even in this case the monetary policy would be would be able to achieve the climate objective. So this is the first finding. Monetary policy per se uh, is not uh, um, cannot reach the, the the target of reducing emissions by 50 percent. What about fiscal policy here? and I will be uh, pretty quickly uh, in this sense. Uh, um, fiscal policy takes the form of a direct emission tax. So basically you have a, a tax imposed on two brown firms that are uh, that is proportional to the emissions produced. And then uh, these taxes are accompanied by an, an abatement technology whereby uh, brown firms can decide to um, make green a share of their production. So in, in this particular setting, emissions are internalized because now in the uh, optimal setting, you have that brown firms will choose to uh, always uh, uh, make green a share uh, mean star of their, of their production. And then we also uh, postulated two particular scenarios where tax revenues coming from the emission tax can be either directly redistributed to um, households or can be used in form of subsidies, uh, um, can be redistributed in form of subsidies to green firms. Now, uh, here um, we consider two particular, I mean, these are the two settings uh, uh, for each economy, but then you have also the cross country dimension. So here we consider um, a global game where each economy has to set uh, uh, its own taxation uh, by solving this problem. So each economy, each country maximizes its own welfare, taking into consideration, taking as granted the tax policy in the other economy and all the constraints imposed by the model by itself. And we are interested here in finding the dominant strategy. So this, the taxation policy that each country would implement regardless of uh, any choice made by the other economy. How do we do that? So first of all, we find the two optimal response functions. So the vector of tax rates that the euro area and the US would choose depending on the choice of the other economy. So this is the solution algorithm. And we focus on two particular equilibria here. The Nash equilibrium, which is simply the intersection of the two optimal response functions uh, of the euro area and the US. And then uh, the cooperative equilibrium. So there is another setting which does not coincide with the Nash equilibrium in this model, where you have that the two countries would tackle not only their own welfare, so the maximization problem is not based on their own welfare, but rather on global welfare. So they choose jointly their two tax rates based on the maximization of the joint welfare of the two economies. So, um, here you have the results of optimal fiscal policy without strategic interaction. So simply the two countries, they maximize their own welfare. And those are the two columns, the first two columns, or they uh, decide to cooperate and they maximize global welfare, by, but they do not uh, engage into the um, strategic interaction. So you don't have the, the game dimension here. As you can see, I mean, pretty quickly, uh, even in the case of cooperation, though the two countries would implement some taxation, uh, however, the global uh, emission reduction would really be really far from 50%, would be around 18%. And then you would also have a decrease in welfare, both for the two countries uh, separately and also globally, minus 0 0.17. So, this uh, policy is not incentive compatible, and this holds uh, both when you transfer the revenues to households and when you use uh, green subsidies, so you subsidize the green production. So this is the first finding. So fiscal policy without strategic interaction cannot achieve the, the climate objective, and it's not incentive compatible. What happens when you... Uh, Maria, you have one minute left. It would be great if you could uh, conclude. Okay, so basically, um, just to conclude here, um, when you uh, introduce the, the cooperative setting with uh, a strategic interaction, uh, you would achieve exactly, I mean, this is a column four and column eight, 
you can see that now the global emission would decrease by 50%, so the climate objective would be achieved. But again, this would not be incentive compatible because you would have a decrease in welfare in both countries. And so how to make this incentive compatible, basically, end of the day, it's to make a, a monetary policy intervene to partially offset uh, uh, through the um, uh, policy intervention, the, the welfare cost of these policies. And you can see that this can be achieved when you have tax uh, taxation, cooperative uh, setting, so the two countries uh, maximize the global welfare, and you have the monetary policy intervention, as you can see in the, in the fourth column here, and the revenues would be transferred to households. So that's the only policy configuration where you would have, uh, uh, you would achieve the climate objective of reducing emissions uh, to a reasonable amount, uh, and you would have also a gain in welfare. So I will skip here uh, the, the dynamics uh, just to show you what would happen to the emission stock uh, under this scenario. So you have cooperation, uh, interaction of monetary and fiscal policy and, and transfers uh, to households. Uh, this is uh, the uh, lowest line in the chart here. Over 15 years, uh, the emission of stock, uh, the stock of emissions X, uh, so not new emissions, but really the overall stock uh, would decrease uh, by 17%, which is uh, the most that can be achieved in this model under all the policy configurations. Um, here I'm gonna, in the interest of time, this I'm not gonna talk about this, but we also show in the paper that uh, tariffs are completely ineffective uh, in uh, as, um, exactly as monetary policy in reaching the objective. So uh, to conclude the main findings, uh, as we said before, we set up this model where we have uh, um, emission externalities so, or uh, uh, climate change as a role uh, uh, because it entails uh, some aggregate losses. Uh, in our framework, uh, we can analyze policies uh, also by taking in consideration the strategic interaction across economies, and so we can quantify spillovers and policy interactions. As I said, monetary policy and trade policies uh, cannot achieve the climate objective, so they are ineffective. Fiscal policy can uh, actually uh, reach the targets, but it's incentive compatible. It becomes compatible, incentive compatible, only when you have cross country cooperation and monetary policy also stands ready to offset partially the negative welfare losses. I mean, the negative welfare effects stemming from this policy. And that's all on my side. Thanks for your attention. And sorry, I was a bit uh, out of time. Thank you, Maria. No worries. Maybe you can unshare your screen. And then uh, I would like to ask Francesca to share her screen. And you have 10 minutes. Thanks. Um, so uh, thanks for inviting me to discuss this paper. I found this a uh, really interesting contribution to, to the literature. And it's one of the few papers analyzing the implication of mitigation policies in an, in an open economy DSG model. Just to provide a background, we know that uh, ambitious climate policy are needed to keep, to keep global warming well below two degrees. And we also know it's pretty clear that uh, efforts coming only from specific countries are not going to meet this target. This means, that, this means that international efforts and coordinated climate policy are, st are strongly needed. And this paper provides a two country, two sector DSG models and analyze the potential of several mitigation policies. Uh, just summarizing the main results, as Maria Sole pointed out, uh, the main instrument to drive the transition is clearly a, a carbon tax. Uh, trade barriers uh, have a limited power in reducing emission for several uh, open economy channels at place, at work in the model. Uh, we also clearly see that monetary policy can uh, reduce and alleviate welfare losses, but of course it's not the main instrument to drive the transition. And we clearly see that cooperation is needed to um, make mitigation policies welfare improving. Now, coming to the contribution provided by this paper, five main contributions are highlighted by the authors. First of all, the results related to nonlinear relationship between GDP and CO2 emissions. 
Here, I will strongly advise the authors to clarify the contribution, even discussing uh, the, result, uh, the results coming from empirical literature and model-based evidence to stress in, in, in which sense this result is going to be innovative and what they are providing to literature, for example, related to tipping points, climate tipping points. Um, the second comment I have is related to the um, the fact that the paper uh, states they are providing uh, an open economy general equilibrium model uh, that can be used to analyze policy implication, welfare implication. I, I strongly agree. I find the paper, um, the, the setup in particular, really, really promising. But I also suggest to clarify in what this setup differs from previous environmental DSG models. And I fully buy the other novelties of the paper, so the estimation, the different policy exercises, the authors performing the paper. Uh, just a few words about the framing and the introduction. I discourage, discourage the use of DICE models. I, I suggest to, use the, to refer to integrated assessment model and to revise some of the statements in that particular section of the introduction. And then I think it's a bit difficult for the reader to, see, to clearly see uh, what, what's the criterion based on which the, the authors select the relevant literature. I understand the need of, the need of reconciling the empirical findings and the modeling part, but it, I think they, they should help the reader much more in contextualizing the contribution, maybe focusing on RBC and New Keynesian model, or also on other setup um, dealing with uh, open economy environmental policy. Regarding the empirical exercise, I, I, re I really like the exercise. I just have a few concerns about the, the way in which returns to capital for brown and green companies are computed, because there is a huge debate about this and no consensus at all. So I think, suggest, I think they, it's needed to provide some robustness check about the approach adopted in the paper to select the sample. And I also, I'm not sure about the categories they, uh, the author select for uh, uh, matching the production structure of the model, because um, I guess the emission time series used to, um, to estimate the model is the overall emission time series for US and Euro area. So in this sense, I see a mismatch between the, the, the way in which the return of assets are computed and the emission time series. And also consider that most of the uh, fluctuation in emissions are driven by energy sectors. And most of the debate about green and brown firms lies in the uh, return from firms in the energy sectors. Um, regarding, the, regarding the models, um, my main uh, uh, my main concern is related to the dynamics of the stock of pollution, because uh, in this model the stock of pollution is driven just by emission from Euro area and US, but there is no model no modeling of emission from the rest of the world. So this shock this stock at business cycle frequency will be should be almost fixed. Uh, so I think at least some discussion about this is needed. Uh, are we getting a, a reasonable dynamics for the stock of pollution? And also I think some details about the calibration of this stock in steady state will be needed. Uh, regarding the damage function, uh, the author adopt uh, a different setup, a different modelization compared to Nordhaus and Golosov. And I'm, I'm sympathetic with this and sympathetic with changes, uh, but keep in mind that the Golos of formalization is a simplified version of the Nordhaus one, and the author in the Econometrica paper clearly showed that this function is able to replicate some climate dynamics. So my question is, the function you adopt is compliant with all of these? And then finally, some clarification in the description of the model in the appendix, with, because I think the notation and was not always clear and I found these sentences, my understanding was that the trade in the model is introduced in the final sector, so maybe I misunderstood something here, uh, otherwise I suggest to have a look at the appendix. Um, 
Regarding the estimation, I found the estimation one of the main novelty of this paper. And in this sense, I would suggest to provide more economic intuition about the emission shock you introduce in the model, because uh, you, you explain this as, as a shock capturing the spillover from uh, other countries. Uh, it was not super clear to me what these spillovers should represent, but given the, the big role that the shock plays in your uh, shock decomposition, I would suggest to provide uh, an intuition for this, and also an intuition for the parameters uh, in your damage, uh, damage function. Uh, then um, I would also suggest to put some model feeds, at least in the appendix, to show what happened to model prediction and model feed when we introduced this additional environmental element and feature in the model. Regarding your policy exercise, um, I I would suggest to clarify this uh, target you use because to me it's really conservative. Uh, there is no agreement in the climate literature, so I think some explanation about the target is needed. And also, uh, I mean, in the presentation, Maria Sole clarified that it was uh, 30 years, maybe, but to me, reading the paper was not really clear the time horizon of the analysis. And my question is, can we run a, a monetary policy analysis in, I mean, over the century? Uh, so can we reconcile the short run uh, nature of the model with um, with long run analysis of climate policies? Then a few words on welfare. What happened to your results if we introduce welfare in the utility function instead of assuming a negative externality on pro in production? And finally, um, I'm quite familiar with the OITAL and Nordau setup, but it's not clear to me why you introduce this abatement just in the fiscal experiment. If so, and if so, are the policy scenarios really comparable if we are introducing these endogenous variables? I'm concluding here just um, telling that I am completely, I, I like very much your um, monetary policy findings because it's clear that the instrument is the carbon pricing, but the debate is sometimes misleading there. So I really like this finding. And I really like the cooperative versus non-cooperative exercise. I would suggest to give more space on, uh, about this in the paper, but I think it's some trade-off and the paper is already very dense. And finally, it would be super nice to discuss the results in line with the current policy debate in Europe and US, I think. And with this, I'm really concluding and I thank you for the attention and for giving me the opportunity to discuss the paper. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Manu, you're still muted. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I clicked on the a mute button twice. Uh, so thanks a lot, Francesca. We have a couple of minutes for questions. I suggest that we collect uh, two, three questions, and then I, I would I'd like to ask Maria to, to respond to those questions and, and in passing also maybe say a few words um, uh, regarding the discussion. So um, who wants to go first? I see uh, Valerio's uh, virtual hand raised. And there's one question in the Q and A chat. If you, if you okay, so if you, if Valerio, you why don't you go first, and then we'll read out the, the question from the Q and A. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first, I, I would like to to to, um, to know whether so what is the response of inflation along the transition. So at the end of your presentation, you uh, plot uh, the the transition to a greener to a greener economy. So I would like to know um, uh, the, the initial response uh, of inflation to uh, the introduction uh, of a tax. And, and then I would like to, to know the, uh, the economic intuition uh, behind the results that monetary policy can help fiscal policy in, um, uh, for, to, to, to reach the, uh, the, 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 the green requirements. Okay, so uh, regarding the first question, actually, this is in line with what I was showing in the empirical part. Unfortunately, I didn't show you the impulse response functions, but actually the effect on inflation is pretty muted. Um, and this is actually something that uh, seems reflected by, by the data. Um, th there are some price movements. I'm trying to, 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 to retrieve now the charts, but I don't have them in the presentation. Uh, but they are, they are not so stark as the, the movements that you see in production. Uh, 
Uh, and then for, for the second question about the, the interaction between monetary policy and fiscal, uh, I think it's really about uh, uh, changing the parameters of the Taylor rule. This is how we, we, we do that. If I, if I understood your question. No, so, so you said that monetary policy can help uh, uh, fiscal policy in uh, making the economy more, more green or so monetary policy on top of fiscal policy well far um, improving. So uh, yeah, I would like to understand uh, I mean, yeah, you, you have a, a loosening, of course. I mean, that, that's how it helps. When we have a loosening, uh, I mean, you decrease the interest rates. Yeah, sorry, I, I completely, okay. <laughs> completely no, no, I was referring more on the on the estimation side. No, no, basically the monetary authority intervenes, intervenes by losing a bit the policy. So, so only because there are some uh, inflation adjustment costs and so on, okay. Yeah, that, that's how it works, yes. It, it, basically, as I said, the, the price dynamics are pretty muted compared to the, to the production dynamics, but then you can somewhat uh, uh, offset these uh, production dynamics by, by using the policy levels. Um, that, that's how it works, yes. So we have two more questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, Mark Cliff is asking, what's your view on the Stern and Stiglitz critique of integrated assessment models? And Glenn Rudebusch is asking, does monetary policy refer to interest rate policy here, plus the shadow rate effects, rather than other broader forms of unconventional monetary policy? Uh, okay, for the, I will uh, reply first to the second question because I feel that I'm more <laughs> expert for that. Uh, yes, it's simply uh, interest rate policy with the shadow rate effects. We don't consider unconventional scenarios here. Uh, but the model is pretty complicated uh, already as it is, uh, and uh, that, that would be an additional thing. I mean, uh, definitely interesting to explore, but for now we stick to a, a more simplified uh, monetary framework. Um, and for the first question, honestly, I'm, I'm not a super expert of these models. That's why, I mean, Francesca was also mentioning this. We don't mention the integrated models in the literature. We were, we're more into dice models. So I, I wouldn't really have a view in this sense uh, uh, for now, at least. I'm, I'm still a bit exploring this type of literature. Thank you. And if you, if you want to quickly reply to Francesca's comments. Yes, and, I mean, I, I, I mean, there were many, many comments that were super useful. And uh, I mean, I, I will ask Francesca then to share also the, the presentation to keep track of everything. Um, you're right. I mean, we are in the process of revising a bit the literature review. This is something that was already mentioned by other um, uh, referee reports. Uh, uh, but this is a, an ever-changing literature. It's always not only there are always new things because of the, the field itself it's pretty new. And our when we started the project, uh, I, I think that many things were not there yet. So no, thanks a lot for mentioning all these things. Maybe it's a it's a good moment to I mean, update a bit our our knowledge. For the empirical part, uh, I mean we took this uh, ROA definition. It's something that is uh, also used internally at the ECB for policy. Uh, reasons we did not, uh, I mean, the empirical part is not the back of the paper uh, or after all. So we, we took something that was already predefined and predetermined. I'm, I'm not even sure what are the types of uh, um, uh, firms inside those categories. This is something compiled by Bloomberg, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, but definitely it would be, it would be interesting to, to focus on certain categories like the energy sector. Um, loss function, that's another big question because, uh, I mean, there is a debate, uh, a huge debate about uh, the loss function itself. Now, the specification we use in the model is the one that works the best because whenever you, you have to um, estimate uh, the model, I mean, uh, and, and you have also these uh, type of uh, climate uh, concerns in the model, uh, the steady state computation might really uh, become super complicated in, uh, in a question of, uh, you know, seconds. And we saw that this specification works pretty bad, uh, pretty good, and it's uh, well established in the literature. Actually, we take it uh, exactly from Golosov and also Oitel. But definitely, we're uh, playing a bit around now in the revision of the paper with other uh, forms, um, other types of uh, of estimations. Uh, 
uh, and then for the rest, I mean, uh, that, that you made so many comments. I mean, I was focusing mainly on these ones because those are the ones that we are w w working the most. Now, one of the comments that you uh, made, and it's really important, uh, it's the fact that these models are really short, uh, sorry, medium run models. And uh, when you consider the stock of emissions, it's uh, uh, something that goes a bit beyond the, the medium term. Now, first of all, let me clarify, it's not over the century. This is something that we were writing at the very beginning, one of the previous uh, draft, but it's really over 30 years. So it's uh, what I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation. And yet we are, we are still trying to reconcile a bit the short termism or medium termism nature of the model with phenomena that are really long term. But this is, a, I think, a problem of the entire literature, of the entire ESG, ESG models. So yes, you, you got exactly the point. I mean, that's one of the main points. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, free, feel free to contact me if you want to talk more. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Um, next paper will be presented by Christian Mattes from Indiana University, and it's going to be on extreme weather and the macroeconomy. Christian, please share your screen. All right. I hope you can hear me. If not, then let me know right away. Um, so. This is joint work with uh, Tuan Fan, my former colleague in Richmond, and uh, Hiso Kim, a fantastic grad student here in Indiana. As the title of the paper suggests, what we're interested in is whether or not extreme weather outcomes, where I'll be very precise about what I mean by that in a second, whether or not extreme weather outcomes matter for aggregate outcomes in the US economy. Now there's obviously been a an, an ex, there has been an existing literature that tries to link weather with the economic outcomes. But so far, these, these, this literature has, has taken one of two approaches. One is to study mainly developing countries and look at lower frequencies, you know, think, think for example, annual frequencies. A seminal work here that I want to point out, but it's really just an example, is an AJ macro paper by Dell, Jones, and Olkin. I think it's very well known in the literature, but other people like Solomon Siang have also worked on this. The second approach that people take is let's focus on a specific, let's look at the US, but let's look at a specific part of the US. For example, Florida, parts of Florida that are hit hard by hurricanes. And let's see how hurricanes actually affect that part of the US economy. Now, obviously, that's a little bit of a almost partial equilibrium analysis. Right, doesn't take into account what happens to the rest of the economy. So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to unapologetically take a macro perspective. We're going to look at macro tools. We're going to, we're going to use macro tools to assess how weather affect, extreme weather outcomes affect uh, variables such as industrial production and the unemployment rate for the aggregate US economy. The first problem we'll have to confront here, and it's one that's really hard to confront, is measurement. How do you measure extreme weather? Now, there are different approaches. For example, you can think about measures of damages due to weather, but they have a lot of problems associated with them. So what we are going to do instead is we're going to take direct measurements of weather events. OK? And I'm going to, and I'm going to spend a, quite a bit of time explaining to you what this measure is that we're using because it's a measure that hasn't been used in economics much. And that we think it's actually a really useful me measure. And then the question to, to drill a little bit deeper, the question that we're interested in is, have these effects changed over time? And you know, if you think about it, these effects, effects of extreme weather could change for various reasons. One is maybe extreme, we extreme weather events have become more common over time, but, but then also, maybe the economy, agents in the economy, firms and households, or the government have learned to adapt to extreme weather events better, okay? So that's gonna be a key, key question that we're gonna answer, and that's gonna guide our choice of empirical tools. So what we're going to do is we're gonna use a nonlinear time series model that I'll tell you about in one of the next few slides. And what we're gonna to find to give you a preview is that the effects of these shocks have become more severe but the volatility has not, okay? So this, tell, this will already tell us a little bit, this will actually point us towards thinking about adaptation. You know, how, how have agents in the economy uh, changed their behavior over time or not? 
But first, let's talk about this measurement problem. How do we measure extreme weather events? So one group of people who think a lot about extreme weather, measure extreme weather events and how to measure them are actuaries, obviously, okay, for obvious reasons. Hopefully that's clear. And so uh, an association of actuaries in the US has actually put together an actuaries climate index. What is this? This is a monthly index of climate risks, okay? Monthly is already very nice because that's high frequency. That's kind of the, one of the frequencies we regularly use in business cycle analysis that's allowing us to borrow tools from business cycle analysis. Sorry, from business cycle analysis. Now, what, how, do we, how do we put together this, uh, this index? It's an index of six different components. They're listed here on the slide. The, this group of actuaries looks at a benchmark period starting in the 60s going up to 1990. And it, measure, it measures various things in this benchmark period. For example, frequency of high temperatures. Okay, okay we can go into detail about what, how they measure high, what they mean by high temperatures, but let's just take that as given. Also, correspondingly, the frequency of low temperatures, frequency of winds, precipitation, droughts, and changes in sea level. And then it's going to ask, let's look at the period after 1990. And let's see, relative to, the, relative to this benchmark period, how have, how, has, how have these events changed? Have they become more severe? That's basically the idea here. Okay. So you have six different components and you're, you're gonna see how they've changed relative to a benchmark period. Okay. So what, we, what they're going to, now still, you might say, okay, these are very, very different events. You're comparing precipitation with temperature. How do you make them comparable? Well, we're going to standardize each component relative to the benchmark period. What does standardization mean? You subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, okay? And then you're going to take the mean of all these standardized variables. And that's going to be our ACI, our actuaries climate index. That's going to be how we, this is going to be a very broad measure, deliberately a very broad measure of extreme weather events that hit the continental United States. This is only for the continental United States. Okay. Here I'm plotting each component. For the sake of time, let me skip this and show you the aggregate. What does this figure show? This is the actual climate index. The bars show you the actual values of the climate index. The black line, which you hopefully can make out here, is a moving average. Okay. And so, so what you can already see is. Up until 1990, this is the benchmark period here, things are pretty stable. And then kind of the first stylized fact is afterwards, clear increase in the average of these climate outcomes. Okay, so this is the data. That's how we are going in our benchmark analysis. This is how we are going to measure extreme weather events. What we're going to do with this is because we want to do, we want to, play by the rules of like standard business cycle analysis, we're going to do a seasonal adjustment on this. But in the paper, in the appendix, we also show that you can redo our analysis taking out seasonal adjustment in all variables, and you're gonna get the basically the same results that I'm gonna show you today, okay? So I'm not gonna spend much time on this. This is a figure that's trying to convince you that seasonal adjustment re works reasonably well, but let's skip that for the sake of time. This is, this is uh, the set of time series that we're going to put into our multivariate time series model to analyze the effects of weather. Okay, so this is the ACI, similar to before, except now we have the seasonal adjustment in it. We're gonna look at year over year growth in industrial production. We're going to look at CPI inflation. In some of our robustness checks, we're also gonna look at core CPI for reasons that will be hopefully become clear uh, as, as we discuss it, as I, as I tell you about it. And then we're gonna have the unemployment rate and a short-term interest rate. Short-term interest rate is the Fed funds rate, except for the zero lower bound period where we're gonna use a shadow rate, the Wuxia shadow rate, okay? So you see during the zero lower bound period, this interest rate actually becomes negative. What I wanna point out is, and this is kind of important, We've, we've chosen to use industrial production because we wanna do this at a monthly frequency. So we don't have to worry about issues of temporal aggregation. GDP is only available at a quarterly frequency for the United States. But what does that mean? 
Okay, one thing we're we are interested in the effects of extreme weather events. You know, if you think about when, when, when there's a lot of precipitation or extreme droughts, you know, what, what kind of area of the economy gets hit very, very hard usually? It's agriculture. Agriculture is not included directly in industrial production. So please keep that in mind. Whenever we look at the effects, kind of the real effects of our weather shocks, which I'll show you in a second, it's, all, it's like a lower bound because we're not directly taking into account effects on agriculture. Okay, so that's one thing I just want to keep, want you to keep in the back of your minds. Now, how do we turn this data into causal statements about the effects of weather shocks? When I have to talk about identification, as I said, I'm, we're going to use a nonlinear time series model because we want to talk about adaptation. We want to talk about change over time. But it's easiest to talk about the identification in the context of a linear model, because then I'm basically going to use this linear model as a building block for our nonlinear model in a way that will become clear in a second. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm, going to, I'm just going to say, well, let me define a forecast error, okay? So whatever model I'm going to write down, it's going to have predictions about what, a, what our vector of variables yt will be next period. And then I can always define a forecast error, okay? Now, what I'm going to do, just like everybody else has done in the VAR literature, pretty much, is I'm going to link my forecast error, ut, to a vector of uncorrelated uh, shocks, et, which I'm going to call structural shocks. And one of my structural shocks of interest will be this weather shock. That's the one I'm really interested in, OK? So in some sense, identification is putting restrictions on the link between uncorrelated structural shocks and forecast errors. So I'm going to have to put restrictions on my sigma matrix here. Again, this, if you've ever taken a class on macroeconometrics, you know this stuff. You've seen it before. And in fact, the identification scheme I'm going to use, you've seen before. But I want to make clear what this identification scheme means in the context of these weather shocks. So what I'm going to, for what follows next, I'm going to assume that ACI, this climate index is ordered first in YT. That's without loss of generality, but it's gonna make my life a little bit easier. How do we identify things? We're going to assume that all variation in the ACI from one month to the next, so all variation in our ACI that we observe that's unexpected in, with, through the lens, when viewed through the lens of our model has to come through the ACI shock, okay? So what we're going to say is, the forecast error in ACI, that's what we're going to call our ACI shock. If you want to think about the traditional language of macroeconometrics, of, of time series analysis, we're going to use basically a, a, a Koleski type identification here. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Let me be very clear. This means the unexpected change in ACI from one month to the next, that's all coming from this weather shock. There's nothing else, nothing else going on in the economy from one month to the next that can influence uh, weather. Makes sense, I th we think. But that does not mean that like low, longer run behavior in the economy cannot influence weather. That's certainly not true, OK? But that would be expected changes. We're talking about unexpected changes from one month to the next. That's our identification assumption. Now, what is the time series model that we're going to build? We're going to build a, a smooth transition VAR. OK, what, what does that mean? We're basically saying at each point in time, the outcomes, yt, are governed by a weighted average of two linear VARs. This is one linear VAR right here. This is the second linear VAR. And the weights are governed by some transition variable, c tilde. This is very familiar to you if you've ever looked at like work by Auerbach and Gordonchenko on fiscal policy, for example. But we're going to do this, we're going to use this in a slightly different way. Okay, we, instead, of our, instead of what Auerbach and Gordonchenko do, we're going to directly impose or, or fix a time series for C tilde. In particular, as our benchmark, but we have a lot of robustness checks for this, as our benchmark, we're just going to use a linear time transition for Z tilde. Okay, it starts at zero at the beginning of our sample and ends at one at the end of our sample. Right, what does that mean? That, well, that, that does a couple of things, right? That, that says, 
Well, you, you know, we, any time variation that we estimate can't be due to some high frequency time variation, maybe due to chain, may, you know, changes in recession in recessions versus expansions or something like that. So we're saying any kind of time variation that we're going to estimate has to be this low frequency change from beginning of the sample to the end of the sample. That's going to make things very transparent, we think, in terms of what type of time variation we identify. Okay. Um, and this is not uncommon. In particular, if you look at a lot of microeconometric studies on climate change, they try to tackle very similar issues by splitting their sample. So we're just doing this as an alternative, but actually as a robustness check, we also do splitting the sample and we find very similar results to what I'll show you in our benchmark. Okay. And again, this is key to studying adaptation or any time variation, obviously. You have five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. I'm almost there. I'm all, I just want to show you the main results. Estimation, we're going to take a Bayesian approach. The only thing you need to know, priors are going to be the same for beginning and end of the sample. So any, any differences between beginning and end of the sample I'm going to show you are going to be due to the data, not the prior. That's all I want to say here. Let me show you the results. These are the results. I'm going to take my five minutes to walk you through these results and then I'm done. Okay. So what I'm going to show you first, these are the impulse responses to one standard deviation changes in the ACI. In the beginning of the sample in blue, end of the sample in red. First, changes in the ACI. What do we see? We see that the behavior of the ACI after shock is very similar at the beginning of the sample versus the end of the sample. So it's not true that actually these weather effects have become more volatile. The level has increased. We've seen that in the data, but the volatility has not. Okay. So any change we're going to identify in the other variables does not come because the ACI behaves differently now. Extreme weather events behave differently. Second, IP growth. Year over year IP growth, what do we see? Beginning of the sample, no significant effects. These are 68% posterior bands. End of the sample, clearly significant effects. Are they large? That's, prob that's how, where, how I want to end it. In the end, I want to convince you that they're probably somewhat reasonable. Unemployment rate. Again, beginning of the sample, not significant. End of the sample, well, barely significant. Certainly more meaningful. Inflation, beginning of the sample, we see a decrease in prices after, an, after a weather shock. End of the sample, we see an increase. Does the, Fed, does the Fed react to this? No. No significant movements at the beginning of the sample or at the end of the sample. All right. Why, what's going on with inflation? we can actually show that all the movements are, are, are in non-core inflation. Core inflation doesn't move after extreme weather events. So it's all basically food and energy that moves in terms of prices. Let me skip this. Let me show you this. Okay, let's look at a variance decomposition at, business, at different horizons, forecast error variance decomposition, you know, like everyone does in macro. We're gonna do this at the beginning of the sample and the end of the sample for our different variables. I'm gonna focus at the end of the sample. This just repeats what I had on the previous slide. First, one thing to note, almost by definition, our ACI shock explains 100% of the variation in ACI. But what what's, for, what's going on for a growth in year-over-year -year growth in IP? We see that at the median, posterior median, well, no matter if you look at impact or one year out, we explain about 2% of, uh, uh, of the fluctuations in IP with our shock. But if you go to the 84th percentile, well, it's almost 5%. That's meaningful, okay? So there's a good chance that this shock actually has, has an, is meaningful for IP. Similar for, for unemployment rate. Median, about 1%, but 84th percentile, so not such an extreme percentile, more than 3%. Similar numbers also for, in, for CPI and for the, in, for the nominal interest rate, it's even 5% at the 84th percentile. Now, you might kill me for this, but let, let, let's, let's try to put this in perspective. Let's compare this to Smet, the Smet, famous Smets Vouters AER paper, okay? They actually look at monetary policy shocks. Monetary policy shocks are a shock that, you know, we have all studied is extensively, okay? We've all thought about a lot. Now, for Smets and Vouters, at their posterior mode, monetary policy shock explains 10% or less 
of GDP growth and inflation at similar horizons. Now you might say they have GDP, you have IP. This is their posterior mode. You look at the 84th percentile, fair enough. But still, I think it's suggestive that, you know, we spend a lot of time as a profession looking at monetary policy shocks. These shocks, these weather shocks could have a sizable effect on outcomes in the US, okay? And I'm probably out of time. Uh, okay, so let me, let me skip. There's a lot more stuff that we do. We decompose this into different, different weather categories. We do a lot of robustness. Let me just show you the conclusion slide. We think, you know, we think there are substantial changes of these weather effects. They have changed a lot over time. That gives us pause. That makes us think what will happen in the future. We think these effects are big enough that macro people should consider them. Central bankers should consider them. And right now our working hypothesis is that there's probably a lack of adaptation going on in the economy that drives these changes. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, also for staying on time. Um, maybe you can unshare your screen and then uh, I would like to ask uh, Miles Parker from the ECB to share his screen. Miles will give the discussion. Helps I mute, I'm mute, that's good. Can, can you see my screen at least? Um, hopefully- We can hear you fine, too. we can see your screen. As it changed too. Um, great, thanks so much. I, I really enjoyed reading this paper. Um, Christian's taking you through the paper itself. I'm not gonna dwell too much. Um, it's not the, uh, as you said, they use a, the actual climate index of natural hazards. So it's the main data climate variable here is uh, a measure of ex ante natural hazard. So higher temperatures, higher sea levels, windstorms, etc. cetera. Um, they find some significant impacts on ma important macro variables more pronounced later in the sample. Um, my thoughts today, I'm gonna go through in basically three blocks. I'm gonna talk about um, citation, implication, and, and adaptation. Um, before I really launch into that, what, one, one thing to note, um, what is a natural disaster? It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a natural disaster, despite what we describe it as. There are natural hazards, the underlying hazards that we look at here of uh, extreme temperatures of windstorms of flooding and so on and so forth um, but actually what that connects with and and is endogenous with the economy itself what matters is the exposure and vulnerability it's not just that it has it happens it's how it interacts with the economy itself now there are a lot of data sets out there that that do ex post and disasters number of people affected damage done etc um, in, in your paper you're quite critical of them it's fine uh, but, but just to be aware, if you look at just simply a natural hazard, you're also missing out these very important interactions, right? So um, I have in my research used both ex ante and ex post. You have to pick your poison is the answer. I think it's worth recognizing that whatever you pick is poison in this. Um, let me just give a quick example for people that aren't aware. Uh, I show in this slide here um, some recent earthquakes in the past 12 years or so that have hit uh, major advanced or advanced economies at least um july 2009 dusky sound earthquake in new zealand 7.8 on the richter scale the largest earthquake in new zealand since the 1931 Napier earthquake damage basically zero i think two houses had their foundations knocked off and and crockery fell off some shells in dunedin take that forward a year you had a 7.2 in darfield that caused four and a half percent gdp worth of damage and set off a whole swarm of earthquakes including the Christchurch one of February 2011, which at 6.2 was a tenth of the shaking of Darfield. But because it occurred 10 kilometers away from Christchurch, New Zealand's second city, it did 10% of GDP worth of damage. The city was pretty much flattened and 75% of residential buildings in the area got damaged. Um, location matters. And that's why it's important to, to recognize that actually ex ante is useful, but not always important in terms of what we care about in macro sense. Um, now, what, what do we care about in macro sense is, is, is the impact. Um, before I get to that, just a few things with citations. You, I actually like, in general, the, the, the number of citations you've done. I think you cover most of the major papers, which is refreshing after a year of COVID papers that kind of ignore anything that happened before 2020. Um, two papers worth looking at, Feldmeier and Groeschel, look again at ex ante impacts, um, and Stroebel's looks at hurricane impacts in US counties. Um, 
and he ha- takes calculates wind spin wind speed from hurricane tracks and also takes into account the exposures. Um, now here he shows at county level that's quite impacting GDP, but actually across state and national level it kind of gets nets net out. Um, two other papers I was really looking forward to seeing you mention, and I was a bit surprised you didn't. Then I realised that actually you've hidden them in the in the footnote. Um, unhiding from the footnote. Um, I remind you of the Noel Coward quote that reading footnotes resembles the going down, downstairs to answer the front door when you're making love. Um, let's have them around the main text. Anyway, um, what, what about the impacts? What gets affected by climate? Well, if you look at Nordhaus, um, he says not a lot, in fact. Agriculture, yes, maybe construction if you have out, outdoor activities, but the rest, and this is, this is the philosophy that underpins the DICE models, basically we're gonna adapt, right? Everything's indoors, we have air conditioning, climate does not matter to us. Um, also reminder that many IAMs don't include extreme weather events, they only consider the gradual increase in temperature. And that means that lots of stuff we're talking about today do not get included in the economic damages involved in IAMs, but anyway. Uh, I could spend a long time discussing how I am, but I'm not going to, to, to today. Um, so let's go, go on that basis to look at your results. Um, and at first glance, the idea that disasters do nothing is about reasonable, right? You calculate impacts on inflation of 0.04 percentage points, which since we used to talk about inflation to one decimal place means you find an impact of inflation of 0.0. Um, compare that to the variation inflation series, where the standard deviation of monthly change in the annual rate is 0.38. So you find the impact on inflation of one tenth of one standard deviation. Um, it's statistically significant, but it's economically meaningless from a macro sense. Um, I can think of very few central banks that would get a knickers and a twist about inflation going up by 0.04. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to mention them. Um, I could stop here. I could say here, right? Case closed, disasters have no impact on the macro, so we, we, we should possibly stop. Um, I, I don't believe that's true, so I'm gonna continue it further and, 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 and say some things that I think are, you've got some useful findings in your paper. One is, what, what is a disaster? What, how does it affect the economy? Now, typically, you read papers and they say, oh, you can assume it's a supply shock, right? Now, Batten and now describe this approach as too simplistic. I, I quote them for two reasons. One, because it's a really, really nice paper that explains the uh, various mechanisms of why these events are also demand shocks. And secondly, because if I had to say a word in it, I'd be far ruder. Um, there are a whole bunch of reasons why these events also cause demand type shocks. Um, again, the paper looks ways. The, the literature on, on disasters actually find this in general, that you do see a positive impact on food in the short run, but often negative elsewhere. Um, now, your paper itself, you find this exactly the same thing. You only sample, you have negative impact on inflation and positive in the second half. So uh, this is great contribution. Um, another nail in the coffin of that climate is a supply shock. So, so please hammer in that nail. Um, my next point is, um, is actually one you mentioned yourself, industrial reduction. What's in it? Manufacturing, basically, a little side effect on a little side show on energy and extraction, but basically manufacturing. Uh, what's not in industrial production? Well, services, that's more than two thirds of the US economy, and agricultural construction. These are two sectors that even Nordhaus in his 91 paper reckons might be affected by climate. So if you constrain yourself by industrial production, you're basically Nelson at the Battle of Copenhagen, putting the telescope up to your blind eye and say, I see no signal. Um, try GDP. You've got a lovely setup econometrically. I, 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 like, I like the framework. So try GDP and try the components. You'll get agriculture, you'll get construction. You have more than enough time series, I hope, to, to, to do it. Um, it you, I know you want to do it monthly, but to be honest, no central bank is going to, oh, most things care about stuff that happens in less than a month. If it doesn't affect me as a quarter, even then we're unlikely to react. But, but at least give yourself a chance here. Um, and that, my final point then really is on um, adaptation. What does it mean? Well, we've had a, a nice event last week, right? A heat dome in, in 
Pacific Northwest, the states in Canada. What, what can that teach us about, about climate and adaptation? Well, here's how it's reported. This picture is taken from the Economist article on, on the heat wave. People sunning themselves on the beach. And if you read in general the press reports about heat waves, you see families frolicking on the beach and eating ice cream. You know, anyone thinks heat waves means great, it's great news for ice cream sales. Um, what's the reality of these events that are becoming more frequent and more intense? Well, here's an actual picture from Lytton in Canada, which is the, the center of the heat wave. And here you see a large part of people receiving medical attention and really struggling. Now, you could think this was just an exaggeration. Um, what does what do heat waves mean for mum and dad? They're normal people on Main Street in Lytton. Well, I can show you Main Street on Lytton on the right-hand picture. You know, it's not there anymore because two days after the peak of the heat wave, Lytton was completely razed to the ground by a massive wildfire of unexpected ferocity and, and size. Um, the, these events are massive and getting worse. We have seen record wildfires in California, in Australia, um, big ones elsewhere in Europe and in Siberia. Um, again, these are events that aren't well captured in IAMs. Um, and that leads to big questions about adaptation. You have some stuff in the adaptation in your paper. I think it's really important to emphasize this. Um, let me give you two bits more information on this um, stuff happening here at the ECB. Um, one looks at insurance, and that's the impact of insurance in, in terms of mitigating these events. So this, these two charts show the impact on GDP from a sample of 45 countries of um, large disasters based on windstorms, earthquakes, um, wildfires, and other stuff. Now, on the right-hand panel, you show what happens when you have a disaster that occurs with a low share of insurance coverage. You see a quite a large significant reduction in GDP in, in the near term, lasting several quarters. In comparison, when you have a high rate of insurance coverage, that impact disappears. If anything, it might be slightly positive, at least in GDP, if not for welfare. Um, but we've already seen following the wildfires in California and Australia, insurance retreat. Uh, and there's good reasons to think that we may actually have a reduction in insurance coverage. Think about people literally trying to get insurance for wildfires now. Um, and that means that this is one, this is one of the mitigating factors we've had in the past, which means that no, we haven't seen a big impact of disasters in US GDP in history, but some of these mitigants may disappear. The Office for Budget Responsibility in the UK yesterday issued a report on fiscal risks. I had a 70 page chapter on climate risks. And they say in a, in a scenario of unfettered climate change, um, UK debt GDP could reach 300% by the end of this century. Um, clearly, fiscal is not going to be able to support the economy following disasters at that point. Um, and the, the last Miles, I want, to, yeah, I want to leave some time for questions. So please uh, come to an end if you may. Thank you. Sure. Sure. And the other thing is this looks at the impact of inflation of heat waves, work at ECB, um, and it shows basically the hotter the temperature you are, the greater the impact. And this is on food price inflation. So just because it hasn't affected much in the past doesn't mean to say as temperatures get hotter that it won't affect it in the future. Um, so adaptation, I think, is a really important question. I'm glad you're emphasizing it. Please do so more. Thank you. Thanks, Vlad Miles. Um, um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I suggest we uh, first uh, go go around uh, to see if there are any questions for Christian, and then Christian can answer those and also reply to uh, Miles' comments. So please raise your virtual hands or um, ask them in the uh, Q and A. I'm not sure I see any virtual hands raised yet. Maybe you're still thinking about your question. So, uh, Christian, do you want to start by replying to Miles' comments? Yeah, And absolutely. then we'll see if we have questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Miles, so much for, the, for your very thoughtful comments. I think you're really spot on, all of them. Um, so, yeah, we're always happy to include more papers. I mean, we were sure we would, we would miss some. So, this is, so the, just the citations, are, are that's very helpful. About the small effects, absolutely. I mean, we, we try to be clear about this. Uh, the way what we find are not huge effects, uh, and that you know the variance decomposition at the end. I try to say, well, maybe there's a chance that these could be meaningful. 
but it is true. So we deliberately want st stayed away from doing this at a quarterly frequency because we had all the other variables at a, at a monthly frequency. We, yeah, but you know, maybe maybe that's something to do at least as one possible specification in the paper to have GDP uh, in there and do a quarterly v version of our VAR. So because it is true, yeah, just you know, we are missing a lot. I, I mean. I actually just rewrote the draft yesterday to clearly say this. Sorry, I I didn't send it to you because I didn't want to send you yet another document. But um, you're totally right, and so that's something we're thinking about. Um, about you know, are these supply or demand shocks? That's actually something that's very interesting. And actually, it seems that our results, you know, if you really think about supply and demand shocks in a very simplistic way, as you know, kind of the co-movement between real effects and inflation effects, it seems to have flipped over, over our sample. And so that's something uh, actually we, we thought about and we, then, you know, some people don't like talking about supply and demand shock. So we, we kind of didn't emphasize in the paper, but again, this is something maybe we should have it in there. Um, and then, yeah, about adaptation, I totally agree. In fact, I have family in, in British Columbia and, they, and then we were just discussing this, this, vil this village and then the sad fate of that village uh, in, in British Columbia. So. Uh, I, was, I was actually aware of that, but it is, it is, it is really frightening. Um, and so that, and so I, we think adaptation is really important, you know? Um, so thanks again. I don't have much to say, except thank you. It's, it, 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 hopefully our paper will, will become better as we, as we incorporate your comments. Thank you, Christian. I, I actually have a question. So, um, yeah. I mean, dis disasters are, uh, tail events uh, and uh, typically the economic consequences of tail events, I think are, is what we care about. So what, how much can your conditional mean sort of uh, analysis uh, tell us and can you use your Bayesian framework to, to, to study tail events uh, in uh, okay. sort of use well, distributions one, with fatter tails, et cetera? Yeah. So one thing I want to be very careful here is, you know, I don't want to call these disasters actually, because, you know, I'm not talking about hurricanes here only. They are in my data set, but I'm talking, or hurricanes or other things, but I'm talking about on average, the US economy becoming hotter or, you know, low temperatures becoming less likely. Those are not things that you would not naturally, not only associate as disasters. Disasters, we think about extreme short-lived events. You know, here we are also capturing these more long-lived changes. And in fact, in, in the paper, I didn't have time to show this. One of the things we show is that the changes in uh, industrial production are actually mainly driven by changes in temperature. So, these, so not these classical disasters that other people have emphasized. If we were only worried about disasters, I think uh, then I would totally agree with you that I probably wouldn't want to have something that's conditionally Gaussian. Um, you know, if you look at the time series of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of our ACI, it doesn't look like, you know, it's totally non-Gaussian. Um, but yeah, if you only looked at disasters, absolutely. Uh, then I would probably want to have to do something with stochastic volatility, T distribution, things like that. Stochastic volatility above and beyond like the low frequency changes we have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, it turns out that uh, we made up some time uh, lost. Uh, uh, so uh, we can now move on to the last presentation which will be, um, sorry, now, uh, by uh, Jocelyn Roman from uh, uh, Paris Dauphine, uh, and will be on policy interaction and the transition to clean technology. Jocelyn, uh, can you please share your screen? Yes, uh, can you see? Okay, good. So thank you, Emmanuel, um, and good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Roman. I'm a PhD candidate at the University Paris Dauphine, and this is a joint work with uh, Hassan Benmir, with a colleague at the LSE. Uh, so the main question we are trying to tackle in, uh, in this article is the role of uh, fiscal, monetary, and macroprudential policies uh, in the fight against uh, climate change. So more precisely, we want to see if uh, monetary and macroprudential policies um, can have a role in uh, mitigating uh, climate change. Uh, so we had a few uh, evidences to motivate the, this paper. So um, models pioneered by uh, Nordhaus um, showed the impact of uh, climate change on, uh, on macro uh, aggregates. Uh, there is uh, another strand of literature that focuses on the, the impact on uh, financial variables or so. And the uh, policymakers uh, recently, um, so Christine Lagarde, for instance, um, pointed out at um, the 
the implications of uh, climate change mitigation policies for uh, macro financial stability. So we thought that it would be uh, a good idea to see if uh, the fiscal environment, environmental policies uh, had a potential side effects uh, and more precisely uh, when implemented through a, a market for, for carbon permits. And so we wanted to, to bridge the gap between uh, the macro finance and the climate uh, literature. Uh, so this was really the, the main objective of, of the paper, to build a, a unified framework to be able to study these kind of uh, questions. And we had two uh, main questions in mind. So what would be uh, the macro and financial implication uh, of the environmental policies needed to, to meet the, the Paris Agreement or even the, the net zero target? And also, um, is there space for macro financial policy? Uh, can they play a role uh, in this uh, transition to a greener economy? Um, this led us to have a few contributions, both theoretical and uh, applied. Uh, we build a green macrofinance model uh, that allows us to uh, assess um, what we call targeted policy. So this is because in, in the European Union, the, they, they don't set uh, the carbon price per se. So we, we call this the targeted policy and we compare this targeted policy uh, to uh, the optimal policy. Uh, we also uh, propose sectoral macrofinancial tools um, that are new to, to the literature. And we also have a, an applied part because we provide a, a numer numerical assessment of uh, the situation in the Eurozone. So we calibrate the model uh, on the Eurozone data um, and we uh, simulate um, short-term disturbances to the economy, as well as find the uh, pathways consistent with uh, the EU goals for 2030. So there, there is also some policy relevance because we assess a, a mix of policies um, that could be coordinated to, uh, to meet the, the climate goal of the, the EU. So regarding the literature, we build on uh, four main strands of uh, literature. So first, uh, the, the macro climate uh, approach. So we borrowed uh, the environmental component of our model um, from Nordhaus and uh, Heutel. Um, we also add the uh, financial intermediaries a la Gertle and Caradi, uh, because we want to see the role uh, banks and uh, the central bank could have uh, in, the, in the transition. And because we have both a green and a more carbon intensive sector in the model, we need to rely on the, on the multi-sector literature as well. And we use macroeconomic tools developed by Lundqvist and Hulig for the optimal policy and by Ajemia and Julia for uh, the extended path method that will allow us to uh, compute the, the transition to 2030. So before turning to the model, let me uh, give you a quick overview of uh, the main results. So uh, we find that a second best instrument is needed, of course, in the, in the EU area, sorry, uh, to be aligned with the, the net zero target. But this uh, instrument uh, induces two uh, inefficiencies. So the first one is a, a welfare loss. Um, we find that we can reduce this welfare loss uh, through a sectoral macroprudential weight, as I will be, will be made clear, clear later, sorry. And uh, another inefficiency is the risk premium distortion uh, that we can uh, almost completely offset uh, through uh, QE rules. And finally, we also investigate um, the benefits, potential benefits of uh, green QE. Um, and we find that there is no incentive for the central bank to engage in a uh, green QE um, if there is no uh, macro potential policy to accompany it. All right, so um, first a, a quick uh, graphical representation of the models. So we have households that will save, consume and supply labor. Um, they will save through financial intermediaries, so they can make deposits and they will get a, a riskless return for that. Um, financial intermediaries will in turn lend to uh, both green and dirty firms and they will get risky returns. So what we'll call the risk premium is the difference between the, the risky return from firms and the riskless return that household gets. And in the authorities, we get a macro prudential authority that will uh, impose the constraints on uh, the leverage of financial intermediaries. And we also have a central bank that can engage in a green uh, quantitative easing or dirty quantitative easing. Also, of course, uh, a tailor rule. So regarding the environmental externality, which is at the heart of uh, our model, um, we have first the aggregation of the final output because we have two sectors. So 
Uh, Kai here is the, the chair of uh, the green sector. And below we have uh, intermediate output. So uh, similar to what uh, Maria Sole presented, uh, we have a Cobb Douglas function with a, a convex uh, damage function that we, we take from uh, Nordhaus. Uh, so this damage function relates the rise in temperature to a degradation in uh, output. And uh, the temperature um, is linked to uh, the global stock of carbon in the atmosphere as well as past temperatures. And finally, the global stock of carbon is um, assumed to uh, follow a slow, slow law of motion and depends also on the, the emissions of firms uh, at time t. So the emissions um, are made by firms. They can abate uh, a part of uh, this emission. So this is the mu uh, in, the, in the first equation here. Um, and also we have two sectors, so green and a, a more carbon intensive sector. And the, the phi here is the carbon intensity of uh, each sector. So of course uh, the carbon intensity is uh, smaller in the green sector. And uh, abatement of the cost, uh, Z, um, which, is, uh, which depends on the parameters theta that we calibrate uh, according to the literature. And uh, th the thetas are smaller in uh, the green sector, which means that the abatement technology is um, cheaper in um, the green sector than the, the dirty sector. And in the end, uh, firms have to make an arbitrage between uh, tax and abatement. So the equation is the profit equation. So the first three uh, components are quite standard. It's uh, revenues minus wages minus uh, the cost of uh, renting out capital. Uh, and the two last components are related to our environmental externality. So the first one is the cost of abatement and the second one is the, the tax. So in the end, uh, firms will equalize the marginal cost of the abatement to uh, the weighted cost uh, of the tax in, in the specific sector. Um, so it's just another uh, condition in the, in the minimiz minimization uh, uh, program of uh, the firms. And finally, the, the banking system very br briefly. Uh, so the first equation is a balance sheet equation. So on the left hand side, we have uh, assets. So claims on uh, green and dirty firms. And the right hand side, we have uh, the net worth, which is basically uh, accumulated retained earnings and uh, the deposits coming from household. And so in our setup, uh, the regulator will require, require that the discounted value of the banker's network should be greater than or equal to the current values of assets weighted by their relative risk. So it means that the lambda t, that is uh, at the beginning of uh, the right hand side of the, this inequality, is um, akin to a Kutter cyclical buffer. So, um, it will react to um, the credit to GDP gap. Um, so basically, if the credit to GDP um, is too far from, too high, uh, too far from the steady state, then the, the, the macro potential authority will, ask, will tighten uh, the constraints and ask banks to, to lend less. Um, and what is new in our article is this uh, sector specific weights, so lambda G and lambda D. So in the baseline model, it will be set to one. So there is no, nothing new here. But then when we implement macro potential policy, we'll uh, allow the regulator to lower uh, these weights, um, thus uh, giving an incentive to banks uh, to lend more to uh, the green sector. So let me uh, define briefly the, the two inefficiencies that we, uh, we uh, identify in our model. So first, uh, I need to define the, the planner's optimal tax. <clears throat> so uh, the optimal tax uh, is related to uh, the social cost of carbon um, that we compute as, <coughs> sorry, as the shadow value um, of the next period social cost of carbon plus uh, the discounted value of damages from uh, rising temperatures. Uh, so this is quite standard in the literature. The only uh, thing different in our model is that we have two sectors. So uh, we need to weight uh, the social cost of carbon by sector to get the, the tax uh, the, the optimal tax uh, within each, each sector. Um, then we define what we call the EU targeted tax. So um, the, the EU, of course, uh, implements the tax through the, the carbon uh, market, but uh, we simplify a bit. Uh, we don't model, um, that, uh, we don't have micro foundation for, for the, the carbon market. And we assume that uh, in the short run, uh, the carbon tax is fixed and can be 
um, hit by exogenous shocks and in the medium to long run, we'll have a trend on the carbon tax that will ensure that uh, the EU is on track for meeting its goal. And so the welfare distortion uh, arises when uh, the tax set by uh, the European Union is different uh, than the, the optimal tax. So the more this uh, tax, this so-called targeted tax, uh, moves away from the optimal tax, uh, the higher the welfare loss. And so we'll show that it is actually the case when we compute this uh, simulation for, uh, for 2030. And regarding our second, uh, sorry, first uh, the, the macro potential policy. So to explain a bit more how it works and how it will help uh, reduce uh, the welfare loss. Um, so as I said, the macro prudential regulator will lower the regulatory weights on uh, green loans. So it will give an incentive to banks to uh, finance uh, more the green sector. And in the end, uh, the green capital will, uh, will uh, rise and this will trigger a rise in the green output. So uh, the result is that the relative share of the green sector uh, will be increased. And because the green sector is less sensible uh, to uh, carbon price and to this, this difference in carbon price compared to the optimal that I showed uh, in, the, in the previous slide, uh, this will lead uh, to a welfare gain or at least uh, a reduction in the welfare loss. Uh, regarding the second inefficient inefficiency that we identify, uh, we first need to define what we call the, the risk premium. So this is the difference between um, the risky return and the riskless rate. And we see that uh, this risky return, this depends on four factors. So psi here is the, the marginal cost um, of a firm within each sector. Uh, so we get the output, the stock of capital, and Q is uh, the market value of one unit of capital. Uh, for each sector. And what we say here is that the carbon price volatility induced by the market design of uh, the carbon permits market um, creates volatility in the marginal cost of firms. And this volatility in the marginal cost of firms will then translate to uh, volatility uh, for risk premium. And so a uh, proposition is to use uh, Q, QE rules uh, to uh, target the, the market value of uh, the unit of capital, which is another component of the risk premium. And this will allow us to uh, compress uh, the risk premium, um, the rise or drop in risk premium that originated from, uh, from the, the shock to the carbon price. Um, so this is actually the, the same, ISD, same idea, sorry, as um, the exercise uh, made by Gatland Karadi. Uh, the only difference is that the shock here does not originate from a uh, shock to the, the quality of capital, like a crisis shock. It's a shock to the carbon price, with, which leads to um, uh, variance in marginal costs and ultimately in the, in the risk premium. But the idea is pretty much uh, the same. So before turning to the result, let me uh, say a few words about the calibration. Um, so. We have uh, business cycle parameters that are calibrated according to standard values from the literature. So most of them uh, are calibrated according to Smith and Wouters. Uh, for sector specific carbon intensities, as well as uh, abatement uh, uh, technology parameters, we'll use uh, data from the, the EEA. Uh, environmental parameters are calibrated according to Nordhaus and Moffat and Dietz and Bensman. We, we actually make a uh, uh, robustness analysis on the, the damage function parameters to see how it impacts uh, the social cost of carbon, on, so the, the optimal tax. Um, as for financial parameters, we take some values from Gatland Credit and we use other to match data for banks in the EU area. Um, for spe sector specific interest rate, uh, we use the paper of uh, Fender and Al at the BIS uh, to uh, match their. Uh, empirical findings. Okay, so here's the, the first result I would show. So this figure displays a transition uh, to uh, 2030 consistent with the objectives of uh, the EU. So the, the green line is 40% uh, emission reduction. So this was the previous goal of uh, the EU. And the blue dotted line is 55% um, emission reduction compared to 1990 levels. 
uh, which is um, being on path to net zero for 2050. Um, so we get these uh, figures by assuming a 0.8% uh, trend in real GDP. So this is the average uh, uh, trend in real GDP over the, the last uh, 20 years in the, in the Eurozone. Um, and we also need to find uh, the trend that is consistent with this uh, emission reduction uh, objective. Uh, on top of that, we had some uh, stochastic disturbances on the TFP and on uh, the carbon price. This is what, what you see here. And the result is that uh, to be on track for the net zero target, uh, this will require a carbon price of approximately 100 euro if we, we remove the, the shocks around the trend and approximately 70 uh, euro for uh, the meeting the, the Paris Agreement. Right? And interestingly, we see that it does not impact much the output. There is only a small difference between the the, the, two, uh, the two curves. But we'll see in the next slide that it's not the case when we compare to uh, the optimal policy. So here we do the same exercise. We just keep uh, the trajectory for 40% uh, reduction in 2030, and we compare it to uh, the optimal policy uh, that is uh, the policy that follows the social cost of, of carbon. And what we see is that, uh, of course, the, the optimal policy does not allow us to uh, reach the Paris Agreement because we see that the emissions are slowly rising over time. And also that uh, meeting the Paris Agreement has a cost uh, in terms of output, and it also has a cost in terms of welfare. Um, so this cost is mainly due to the difference in the carbon price. So as I explained earlier, the targeted price of the EU is higher than uh, the optimal price given by, by the, the model. And so this gap will uh, grow over time and uh, will go to approximately 45 euro in 2030. And this is uh, consistent with the rise in uh, the welfare loss uh, over time. So then what you we have, do is that- You we... have two to three minutes left, please. Okay. Start. Okay, sure. Uh, so then what we do is, is we implement the, the macro prudential policy. So we compare a situation uh, where the aggregate tax is the optimal tax, 22 euro, to a situation where the, the tax is the 100 euro. And then we add uh, this macro prudential policy, as I explained before. And what we see is that the rise in the green output um, and in the relative share of the green sector leads to a reduction of the welfare loss of approximately 30%. So we could completely close the gap if we were to uh, have a very low uh, weight on uh, green loans, but it would not be realistic and we prefer to keep uh, only a 30% drop in the, in the weights. Regarding the, the other inefficiency, uh, very quickly. Uh, so um, this is a, an IRF, IRF, sorry, to uh, a carbon price shock, so a positive carbon price shock. And we see that when the central bank does not act, uh, we have a rise in uh, both uh, spreads. However, when the central bank follows um, a QE rule uh, can, um, similar to uh, what is done in, in Gertland Karadi, uh, the spread is completely uh, completely uh, offset. The rise in the spread is completely offset with uh, purchases that are not uh, not enormous. And here we make a comparison when the macro potential is active. But I will skip it for now. Um, and then we have also a part uh, where we investigate the, the, the um, interest of having green QE compared to dirty QE. So I, I don't have much time, so I will just get to, to the interesting points. Uh, what we find is that there is no difference between dirty and green QE uh, when there is no macroprudential policy, simply because the two assets are perfectly substitutable for uh, banks. Uh, however, when we introduce macroprudential policy, uh, we break this perfect substitutability. And then there is a trade-off for the central bank, either green QE, it means less emissions, but also less outputs, or a dirty QE with uh, more emission and, and more output. Uh, so just to conclude, let me uh, give you the main takeaway. So we find that the second best policy is needed because the optimal policy is not enough to, uh, to reach uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, but that it induced two inefficiencies, a welfare loss, uh, and the risk premium distortion. So we uh, are able to reduce a bit the welfare loss by using sectoral macroprudential weights. And we can almost completely offset the risk premium distortion by um, using QE rules. Um, also, uh, green QE um, is not 
is not really uh, interesting for the central bank unless uh, there is a macro financial policy active. So thank you. Thank you very much, Josla. Um, maybe you can unshare your screen and then I would like yeah. to ask uh, the discussant, um, Valerio Nispilandi from Banca d'Italia to share your screen. Yes. Valerio. Yeah. Valerio, um, yeah. we're not seeing your screen yet. Yes, here it is. Uh, sorry for that. Now it's coming up. Yeah. So, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Valerio Spilandi. Uh, I'm from the Bank of Italy, so the usual disclaimer apply. I'm going to discuss this very interesting paper and I'm very happy to be here. So let me thank also the organizers for having invited to discuss this, this, this paper. So let's start with the motivation of this paper. Uh, as, as you know, since the industrial revolution, we have been observing uh, an exponential increase in, in the stock of carbon in the atmosphere. And, and according to, to scientists or the scientific community, um, this increase in carbon uh, has driven a similar increase in global temperature. And, and, and this increase in global temperature is, could be dangerous for, for our planet and also, of course, for, for market economy. So this is what motivates uh, the analysis of, of, of Jocelyn and Gassan. Uh, and in particular, they um, want to uh, analyze which is the uh, optimal policy mix uh, to face this climate change challenge. So they, uh, they uh, set up a, a, a new Keynesian model with two sectors, a green sector and a dirty sector. In the model, um, there are financial frictions on like Gerter and Karadi and a pollution externality in the production function. So they uh, study uh, the introduction of, of a carbon tax to meet the requirements of the Paris agreements. Um, and, 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 and then they uh, um, want to uh, analyze how market potential measures and uh, asset purchases by the central bank can uh, help to, uh, to reach the Paris agreements or to uh, uh, make the transition uh, more, uh, make the transition smoother. So the key findings are the following. So they show that a carbon tax to meet the Paris agreement is welfare detrimental, but if, if, you, if you use macroprudential policy or um, asset purchases, you could offset, uh, you could partially offset the welfare cost um, of, the, of the carbon tax. So I, I think that Jocelyn made a very um, good job in describing the, the, the model. So let me just uh, focus, uh, let me just focus on the inefficiency, on the inefficiencies in, in, of the model. So this is a new Keynesian framework. So there are new Keynesian inefficiencies. There, is, um, uh, uh, there are time varying markups and, and price dispersion, which, which is inefficient in equilibrium. Then there is a Gerter Karadi inefficiency, which is a leverage constraint on, on banks. So uh, there, 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 there is a, a time varying credit spread in equilibrium, actually credit spreads, uh, so spreads between uh, uh, the return on capital, the return on green and dirty capital, and the stochastic discount rate of households. And finally, there is an environmental inefficiency. So it, this is the pollution externality, uh, which is in the production function. So just to understand the, the mechanism of the model, suppose uh, a shock that raises the output gap, like a, a demand shock, a preference shock. So uh, inflation goes up through the new Keynesian Phillips curve, uh, and this is going to generate price dispersion, which is inefficient. So this also uh, uh, drives uh, an expansion of economic activity. So credit spreads go down and given the rise in output, the emissions will go up. So the emissions uh, are going to fuel the stock of atmospheric carbon, temperature is higher and total factor productivity through the pollution externality will be, will be lower. So my general assessment is that uh, the, the research question is uh, very interesting and, and timely. Uh, I think the model is really state of the art and, and very appropriate for the purpose. Uh, 
I, I'm going I'm, I'm gonna to make some uh, comments and suggestions on, on the policy exercises. So I, I think that uh, the authors could improve the, the policy exercise to, uh, to provide sharper, sharper conclusions. Okay, um, so my, my question is, so which role plays macroprudential policy along the transition? So um, what uh, Gassan and Joslen uh, do is to carry out a, a steady state analysis. So in this steady state analysis, they, uh, they study how the steady state of the model is affected by a carbon tax and macroprudential policy. They also do a transition analysis, but, but without macro pro and without uh, uh, financial frictions. However, in, in the Goethe and, Fra and, and Craddy framework, uh, when you introduce a carbon tax, uh, the, the city state, uh, the, the city state credit spread is not affected. Because in this model, the city state credit spread uh, depends only on bank specific factor, factors like the, the, the discount factor. Uh, of bankers. So I think in this case, the interaction between the carbon tax and macroprudential policy is, is less relevant. And, I mean, you, you need macroprudential policy to address financial frictions. But uh, in the steady state, the introduction of a carbon tax is, doesn't have any impact on the financial inefficiency on, inefficiencies on the model. So what I suggest is to focus on a transition analysis with financial frictions. And in this way, you can, um, you can analyze how the economy adjusts after the introduction of a carbon tax to meet the Paris uh, uh, requirements. And you can also study uh, the crucial role of macroprudential policy in, uh, uh, in smoothing the transition. So what I guess is that the introduction of a permanent carbon tax would generate a temporary recession and a temporary increase in the credit spread. So in the, in the, city state, in the final city state, the credit spread is going to be equal to the initial city state. But during the transition, I, I, I guess that the credit spread uh, is, going to, uh, is going to increase. So my question is, can macroprudential policy play a role? And, so there are some papers on, on, on this topic. Um, there is also a paper by, by, Fran by Francesca, who is here, uh, that make some, some step in this direction. But of course, th uh, this literature is in its uh, infancy. So I, I think that there is room for, for further research. And I strongly suggest uh, the, um, um, Jocelyn to, uh, to focus on this transition analysis. So my second comment is about macroprudential policy. Macroprudential policy is modeled as a change in the lambdas. So uh, the lambdas are the, the risk weights in the leverage constraint on, of bankers. So this is the constraint. So the value of the bank must not be lower than um, this fraction, the fraction lambda of the assets. So uh, as G and as D are uh, green and dirty assets respectively, and they, uh, they, the authors also allow for um, a, 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 a specific risk, risk weight assets to the green sector and to the dirty sector. So my point is, so if this is uh, an, an instrument for the, government, for the government, why doesn't the government set all the lambdas equal to zero? So in this way, the government uh, will, uh, would be able to completely eliminate inefficient financial frictions. So my, my suggestion is you should consider the constraint, so this leverage constraint, as a structural feature of the model, exactly as in the original Gertler and Craddy formulation, and not as a, a regulation. And, and of course, you can, then you can model macroprudential policy, uh, macroprudential measures uh, as a tax or subsidy on net worth or on, or on assets. So other papers uh, uh, did something did something similar, but if if, if you sh if you choose this formulation, well, uh, for the government it is optimal to set lambda is equal to zero, and this constraint is never binding. And, and finally, just a, a final comment on on, on green QE. So the authors showed that uh, a, a market neutral QE or a dirty QE increases emissions 
because QE um, uh, is able to expand the economic activity and of course emissions are higher. A key finding of the paper is that the, the rise in emission would be lower if the central bank buys only green assets. So a, a green QE is less welfare detrimental than a, a dirty QE or a market neutral QE. Um, I, I see two problems in, in, in these conclusions, or at least two, two caveats. Um, uh, so uh, uh, first, uh, the effect on the stock of pollution is negligible. Pollution is a, a, a very slow moving variable. Uh, the the, the half-life of pollution is around uh, 90 years. So green QE or, or other monetary policy instruments are not able to affect this. Uh, uh, these uh, slow, slow moving variables. Uh, moreover, the effect, the, these effects are transitory because the authors consider only temporary, uh, temporary shocks. So my personal view is that climate change is a long run phenomenon and could, could not, could, couldn't be affected by a civil instrument such as monetary policy. And I'm done, and basically. So uh, I, I think this is a very timely paper on the uh, policy mix, uh, on the optimal policy mix. Uh, um, um, to address the climate challenge, my suggestion is to focus more on, on a transition uh, uh, analysis. And I'm done. Thank you so much, Valerio. Um, I suggest that we, again, collect a couple of questions. There was one in the chat. Uh, raised uh, during the presentation uh, by Massimo, I think, uh, who's asking um, um, whether um, the constraint is binding in the neighborhood of the steady state, um, the ICC constraint for banks, and um, and whether um, um, sorry, you've said the time varying, which implies there might be a state of the world. Um, um, especially with uh, unconventional monetary policies where it might not bind. Is this an issue in your model or do you explicitly solve taking it into account? Uh, that's the question that we have. And uh, if you have other questions, please raise your virtual hands or put them into the chat. There's also one question in the Q&A by, by Sophie. If you, I'm not sure if you've seen that. I haven't, can you read it out? Sophie asked, what is the reason for modeling climate damage in the sectoral production instead of in the final output? And I see that Francesca raised her hand. So Francesca, please. Thanks. Uh, just a clarification question, because the target uh, related to emission reduction in, the EU, in Europe is 55% uh, starting from the level of 90. 1990. So, but in your transition dynamics graphics, the emissions start decreasing and decrease by 55%, but starting from 2020. So, which is your steady state here? Maybe I was wrong. I don't know. Thanks. Okay, maybe I would answer to Francesca first. So, no, we, we don't. Uh, the emissions don't go to 55%, it goes to something like 67 or something like that. It's We, we make sure that it corresponds to 55% compared to uh, 1990 levels, yes. And for the question of uh, Sophie, so what's the reason for modeling climate damage in the sexual production instead of in the final output? So usually in the literature, the climate damages are, are modeled in the, in the Cobb Douglas uh, uh, function as a, as a damage function that uh, impact the, the productivity. Um, so we, we just stick to, to what is done in, in, the, in the literature. And for the, the remark of uh, Massimo, so I was actually not uh, aware of this, uh, this issue. So I will uh, take it into account. I will look into it and uh, try to see if it could be an issue uh, for our model. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, I was not aware of it. So maybe uh, I can also say a few words uh, about uh, Valerio's discussion. So first of all, thank you very much for, for the discussion. So um, regarding the, the, the issue you raised about the, the steady state analysis, uh, so you said that the, the spreads, the, the steady state of the spreads uh, was not impacted by the introduction of carbon price. So this is uh, very true, uh, but we uh, don't use the steady state analysis to um, analyze the impact on spread. We use it to analyze the impact on the welfare. Uh, 
And for spreads, we use uh, IRF. So uh, in this case, uh, carbon price shocks can impact uh, the dynamics of uh, the spreads. Um, then you um, you propose to to make the the transition pathway with uh, the macro prudential uh, weights varying over time. So this is a, an idea that we had actually. Uh, we wanted to do it, but it's quite uh, heavy uh, heavy uh, computationally. Uh, so we we couldn't do this. Um, that's why actually in the part with the when we simulate uh, transition pathway, we uh, make a simpler model where we remove. Uh, the the banking sector, so we could not have uh, this uh, macro prudential uh, uh, in the in the transition. Um, yeah, then you 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 said that we could just put the the lambda to to zero, so that we we would have uh, an infinite stock uh, of capital. Uh, but the the way uh, the constraint is written is that the the first lambda is uh, the capital requirement for banks. So this is like the the Basel three. Uh, this is like the with weighted assets, et cetera. So this is really a representation of that. So if you say that you put lambda to zero so that the constraint doesn't bind, it means that you don't have any capital ratio for banks. So maybe, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if, it, uh, if it would be a, a good idea. And then you you, you talked about the, the tax subsidy scheme. So I think you referred to the article of Gertrude Cardi and Kyotaki, um, where they have a, yes, a tax subsidy scheme on the networks and on, on the assets. So we actually tried it. Uh, it doesn't change the model. Uh, it changed a bit uh, the, the result for uh, the macro prudential policy, but we felt like it was not very realistic to say that uh, we're going to tax the net worth and uh, subsidize uh, some assets. So that, that's not how it's done in practice. And we felt like the the the, um, the risk weighted asset specification was more in line with uh, what is done in, in the reality. And um, regarding QE. Uh, yes, you said that we, we wrote that the, the green QE is less uh, welfare detrimental. Uh, so actually, um, it's not exactly what we say. What we say is just that when uh, there is a macro uh policy in place, um, there is uh, an incentive for the central bank to engage in green QE, but that it is a trade-off between uh, output and emissions. So in the end, uh, we don't even know if it welfare enhancing or welfare detrimental compared to uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the um, QE. And uh, I agree with you on the fact that uh, QE effects are transitory and that it doesn't do much on the stock of, uh, of carbon. But still, I think we can, we can try to assess the effect on the emission because that's what we're interested in this paper. Uh, we're only focusing on, on the euro area and we want to see uh, if there is a better way to to do asset purchases, that's all. But yeah, it, it doesn't make a, a lot of difference. I agree on the on the global stock of uh, carbon. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we've already reached the end of our session. Two hours uh, passed very quickly uh, with these interesting papers and presentations. I would like to thank um, all of you, the presenters, but also the discussants for excellent contributions. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope you did too. Uh, um, thanks also to Christoph uh, for uh, selecting the papers and discussants uh, very wisely and carefully. And um, uh, let's all keep in touch and uh, on these important issues and um, 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 be safe and have a great summer. Thanks again. Uh, for sorry, being part just, of the session. Thank you. Just make a tiny, tiny intervention. Uh, DCB just announced it will announce the results of its strategy review tomorrow at a press conference. So if you're here, what he has to say about climate and what it tends to in terms of much policy. Tomorrow is a going to be interesting day. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.